Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, and welcome to the Six by Six Social. Uh, I see we've got you know we've got our, our regular and loyal supporters in tonight, so it's good to see see all of you again, and a few new faces joining us this evening, which is which is great. And um, for those of you that are new, just a, a little bit of background: Six by Six is a group of photographers that that came together in Liverpool last year. Um, and uh, and our remit really is to we put on shows of exhibitions of documentary photography for six weeks at a time in a in a wine bar called Ropes and Twines in Liverpool, and and the beauty of it is really it's it's just sharing documentary work from all different types of photographers, different subject matters, and as alongside the exhibitions we invite people to speak and we have these social evenings, but of course we can't do that at the moment in in the lockdown, so we've been doing it online. And we do this every two weeks, every Thursday evening, every two weeks. So, um, so if you want to keep up with what we're doing, uh, follow us on Facebook or sign up to the newsletter and we can keep in touch with that way. Um, now, it's, it's kind of weird because we're coming out of lockdown a little bit tonight. And, and, um, and it, feels like, it feels like that because I'm the only, I'm the only six by sixer in Merseyside tonight. Uh, Colin is up in Edinburgh. Um, Steve and Steph, I think, are on their way back from Newcastle, from a new shoot in Newcastle. And Adam is out in Wales somewhere and can't join us this evening. So um, I'm going to introduce uh, Jack in a minute and uh, he's going to talk about what can only really be described as an epic, epic project, which uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing about. Um, I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute, but if you don't mind, I just want to say a big thank you to all of you who have um, who bought a copy of my Fisher Women portfolio. Um, I think we've cleared the backlog of orders now and and so if you haven't received your copy yet it should be with you in the next day or two and I'm really appreciative of the support so thank you and, uh, and if anyone does want a copy and hasn't ordered I'll pop a link in the in the chat um, and really you know just talking about Fisher Women it kind of brings me on to, to Jack Lowe um, and it's been great because I followed I followed Jack's work with his LiPo uh, station project for a number of years and we've talked on and off about how our, our, our paths kind of, you know, they've never crossed physically out in the landscape. But, um, but we know a lot of the same places, we've probably met a lot of the same people, and it's endlessly fascinating to me how two photographers, when they photograph or, or visit a similar landscape, how differently we see it. And certainly Jack's, Jack's vision is quite unique. So um, what can I tell you about Jack Lowe? Uh, He'll, you know, he'll talk about his own background and his early interest in lifeboat and all that kind of stuff. But I first came across Jack as a, as a printmaker many, many years ago. And, and he's worked in and around photography for a long time as an assistant, as a photographer, as a printmaker, as a retoucher. Um, but all of that really appears to have been the hors d'oeuvre for, uh, for the main event, which is the Lifeboat Station project, which started in 2014, I think, Jack, is that right? Yes, yeah, so, yeah, I, got, I got the blessing for it in 2014 and went uh, on the road for the first time in 2015. Yeah. So. Okay, so this, this is kind of an eight year mission, which is um, maybe a little bit delayed now over the last couple of months. But, um, but the, the mission is to, to photograph and meet lifeboat crews from all 238 lifeboat stations all around the coast of, of Britain and Ireland, which in itself is a mammoth, mammoth task. But, uh, but that isn't the half of it, as we'll hear. You know, that really is the short, short version, the really short version of it. Um, and there's so much more than that. And I'm going to hand over to Jack and he will regale us with tales of travels and effort and research and just pure, pure dedication to what is a labour of love. So, Jack, over to you. Thank you so much, Craig. And thank you for the, the, uh, the invitation, six by six, and the introduction, Craig. That was excellent. Thank you. Um, and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, I can see some friends and patrons here, um, dedicated in their own way, <laughs> very, very patient. Um, and I'll now share my screen. I need to remember my computer sound, share. So hopefully you can now see my screen. Right then, yes, the Lifeboat Station Project. Um, this graphic, uh, can you see all the orange dots there? Um, that's one dot for every single lifeboat station. 
So that's 238 lifeboat stations in the UK and Ireland, and um, therefore 238 lifeboat stations on my journey. Um, and it, as you can see, it's quite a big journey. You know, when you see it represented like this, it's uh, even to me, <laughs> it looks daunting. And I'm about to do my best now to attempt another tricky task, which is to keep it brief and um, tell you about lots of layers within the project just over the next 40 minutes, 45 minutes or so. So where did it all start? And why lifeboats and why photography? Well, I um, have been in a chapter of my photographic life, as Craig just mentioned, um, where I've been printmaking for 12 years for, you know, for other photographers and designers, and, um, and I've been a retoucher as well. And it was a, a 12 year tangent, to be honest, because I hadn't really, really expected to do that um, as a, a chapter in my photographic career. But um, it was one of those things where you, you're left thinking, well, why am I doing this? And you kind of have to not only enjoy the challenges that are, are set, but also to just know that there'll be a reason for it. And it transpired when I um, started to look for something different in life, something, you know, a different photographic journey to go on. Um, that all of those things that I'd learned in my printmaking career, my assisting career, and my previous photographic career. And in these moments, as I was a child, this is me about nine years old in York with a camera around my neck there, um, everything came together for this lifeboat station project that I dreamt up. You know, it's all my idea of this. I haven't been commissioned to do it. Um, it's something that I've entirely thought of myself. And um, the aficionados among you all might just be able to make out that I'm wearing my Storm Force badge there, which is the RNLI's junior membership club. So as a nine year old, I've got my Kodak Instamatic around my shoulder um, and my Storm Force badge in this photograph by my late mother. Um, who I'm sure would love to see all this too, um, if she'd been around to see it. But um, basically, when I was looking for a change in my, in my career and trying to work out what I really wanted to do, I knew it had to be special. And so I looked back to my childhood passions. Um, and, you know, like any other young boy, I, I was into model railways and Lego, um, but I was also into lifeboats and photography. And this is my first photograph of a lifeboat. That I took when I was nine years old. This is the um, Brighton lifeboat in Brighton Marina um, and Atlantic 21 and so it all started very early and this is me now. Um, well not now sorry in 2017 but you know this is how the scene looks now. This is a typical working day for me on on the coast. I aim to photograph about 30 lifeboat stations a year between March and September um, and the reason why it's between March and September is because uh, that's generally about British summertime, and that's when I can get the best quality of light uh, to work all day long with this old process. Um, and, you know, I just love it. It's, an, it's a scene that never grows old to have my camera with me over my shoulder. And in this particular case at Castle Town Bear in Ireland, this is a seven class lifeboat, the biggest class of lifeboat that the RNLI build. Um, and that thing will go into any sea, any weather, um, hence the name all weather lifeboat. 42 tons, three and a half thousand horsepower, and I've driven a few as well. It's, uh, it's an amazing thing. And this is a typical scene on the on the coast. Um, as you can see, you know, this is um, in Fishguard in Wales. Um, lifeboat behind there and the crew all gathered and I've got them all poised and briefed. You know, so this is, every time I'm on the road at a lifeboat station, this is uh, the typical kind of scene you'd come across. And this is me at work. <laughs> it's not really, this is, um, as you might recognise or read at the bottom there, Marcus Sparling. This is Roger Fenton's photographic assistant back in the day. And I, and I like to show this photograph because there's very little difference between how Roger Fenton worked in the 1800s. You know, Roger Fenton was a true pioneer of photography. You know, really started to make it into photography, uh, photography as, as we know it today. And um, I only realized relatively recently that he was the first um, commissioned war photographer um, when he I mean I knew they'd photographed the Crimean War but I hadn't realized that that was the first piece of commissioned war photography for um, you know, it was commissioned by his patrons and um, the publishers but 
so many similarities with how we work. And the only real difference, to be honest, is the vehicle we travel in. Um, so this is his converted wine merchant's van. And this is my mobile darkroom, which is a decommissioned NHS ambulance. Um, as you might be able to read there, depending on the quality of the feed, um, she's called Nina. And if you haven't clocked why she might be called Nina as a decommissioned NHS ambulance, I'll leave that with you for the moment and you can ask me at the end if you like. Um, but here she is in all her splendor, you know, one of my really beloved items, you know, she really is a happy place for me because I've made over 2000 glass plates now and you can find around 600 of them on, on the website, you know, 600 finished glass plates on the website. Um, and they've all been made in this vehicle. And you know, she's, she's looked after me for thousands and thousands of miles of traveling around the coast of the UK and Ireland. And these are my memory cards. You know, I, as you might be able to imagine this, you know, by working with an old process like wet collodion, you know, so bear in mind the process was invented in 1851. I can't just load up memory cards into a, into a kit bag um, and just know that I'll be able to shoot thousands and thousands of images. I have to think how many pieces of glass I'm going to carry on the road. Um, and the, the pieces of glass, they're all 12 by 10 inches. Here's one. This is, this is the size of the glass. And this is just ordinary picture glass um, that's cut by my picture framer um, downstairs. Um, so it's nearly the size of an album cover, you know. So if you're going to travel to lots of... Um, if you're going to travel to lots of lifeboat stations on the coast for a number of weeks, you have to anticipate right from the start how many photographs do you think you can make, you know. And so I roughly allow about 10 per lifeboat station. And bear in mind that I try and work at 10 to 12 lifeboat stations in a run, which will mean that I'm on the road for about four to five weeks. So 10 to 12 lifeboat stations, that's 120 sheets of glass that I'm carrying uh, on board Nina in specially made boxes, which we'll come to in a moment too. Um, I think it's just here actually, here are the boxes that a chap called Mark makes for me. Uh, so you might know him, Mark Bose, a very, very skilled camera maker and photographer. Um, you know, he's one of those fantastic people who's great at everything he turns his hand to. Um, and you can see these boxes that we've designed together and he, he makes for me. I've got about 16 or 17 of these boxes now, depending on the number of plates I want to put in each one or how much I want to carry on the road. But so yes, do you see I need to uh, think way ahead of going on the road. When I speak to Mark about the chemicals that I need to order from him that he mixes up for me um, and how many sheets of glass I'm going to carry. And this is what Nina can look like when she's packed up um, and ready to go. This is actually quite a small trip. I think we're going to see eight, oh no, 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 about 11 glass boxes there. Um, and I remember this moment very, vividly because I was in Kirkwall at about half past ten at night and for those that um, don't know Kirkwall is the major town on Orkney um, the set of islands just north of the mainland of Scotland and I was about to get the ferry to Shetland and Shetland is a long way north of, of Kirkwall and I, I think people sometimes don't appreciate it and I have to say I got a bit of a fright when I went to um, between Wick and Thurso and I took the slightly longer route round to see that famous sign you know the one with all that points to all of the uh, places like Ed, you know, Edinburgh, New York and it had a sign to Shetland that was 152 miles north of John O'Groats so it's an eight hour overnight ferry journey from Kirkwall to Lerwick on Shetland and um, just after this moment I strapped it all down because all I could think of was you know we're in the North Atlantic I really really want to make sure that these glass plates are all fine for that journey. And I find myself when I'm making photographs in some really epic scenes, you know, that, and it was very daunting at first, to be honest, you know, I'm going into new communities each time. You know, communities that are sometimes built up over generations. Bear in mind the RNLI is nearly 200 years old. And in this photograph, um, I was up in Bucky in the northeast, on the no northeast coast of Scotland. And this is, you know, a really established lifeboat and um, seafaring town. Um, and as I progressed the journey, you know, year after year, I became much more comfortable in this kind of situation. And, and as people, uh, as my vision became clear to people, they were able to uh, be on side from the start, you know, so everything became, started to become gradually much, much more relaxed after 
the first few months in that first year in 2015. So this is a typical scene when I'm briefing the crew um, just before we're about to make the photograph. And here's another epic scene that I just still have to pinch myself, particularly now, you know, during lockdown, it's, it's, it feels almost dreamlike to think back, you know, and think, was I really there? And I'm glad I got all this evidence that I was because this is an extraordinary scene, really. You know, a state of the art Shannon class lifeboat just poised exactly where I wanted it to be on the shingle bank uh, at Dungeness. You know, if you see lots of shingle, it can be pretty, pretty much guaranteed it's going to be on the south coast somewhere. Um, and that big groove there, just between the crew and me, um, that's where the lifeboat beached the previous night uh, on exercise. When they, this is a mobile slipway you see her sitting on here. And so to recover the lifeboat, they drive her at 20 knots at the beach. It goes against every mariner's, you know, goes, goes against the grain of, of every seafarer's mindset to drive your multi-million pound boat um, hard at the beach. Um, but that's what they do. And there's the groove that she left and they just uh, popped her back on the mobile slipway, spun her around and she's ready for the next launch within 10 minutes. And so all the while while I'm dealing with those epic uh, scenes, you know, when people are waiting for me, it can be hard enough making a group photograph at the best of times. You know, if ever you've done that yourselves, you'll know exactly what I mean. You know, it it could be like herding cats. And so I then have to bring in the vagaries of wet collodion into that as well. I'm hand making my photographs in the moment. So bear in mind if I just briefed a crew there out on the shingle, I've had to quickly march back and tell them just to wait for me while I go back and, and I hand make a, a piece of photographic film in those moments. It takes me about six or seven minutes to do it. And then I have to march back with it to, um, to the crew who are waiting for me. And so this is the start of the process that you see happening here. I won't cover the whole process in detail. You know, if we've got time in the uh, session afterwards, you know, at the end of this talk, I'll happily answer any questions that you have. But this is just a, a very, very quick overview at this stage. But there you see me pouring salted collodion onto a 12 by 10 inch piece of glass. Uh, and I'm about to put it into the silver tank um, to sensitize the plate. And then this is a, I can actually feel what it's like to be in this situation now. You know, I, I can really, it transports, transports me right back to being in Nina at this critical moment. What you might be able to see there in the middle is, is a, now quite a, an opal uh, looking, you know, quite a milky looking piece of glass. So that's the photographic emulsion now ready on the glass. I've pulled it out of the silver tank and I'm loading it into the plate holder, uh, ready to then march back to the camera and plug it on the back of the camera. And so this is the situation you see with, with the Bucky crew, where I've now got, um, I'm just doing a focus check there on the right hand side, and I'll have the plate in my companion by my feet. Companion is the, the name for the wooden box that I carry all my accoutrements in, um, ready just to take off my focusing cloth, ask them all to stay in exactly the right spot, and I'll then um, plug, the, plug the plate holder on the back of the camera, ready to make the plate. Cut a long story short, I expose the plate and I can come to that towards the end as well if you'd like. You can see the camera's just here. The, I don't know if you can see me. Can you or not, Craig? Can people see me or not? Yes, I can see you, yeah. 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 Um, there's the lens cap, look, 115 year old lens cap. That's my shutter. So I've exposed the plate. And then once I've done that, it's time to unplug the plate holder from the back of the camera, quickly march back to Nina again, and I bring some crew with me. Um, you know, eight or nine of them can cram into the back of Nina and watch me uh, process the plate. And there's this magical moment afterwards when once the, the bulk of the processing is done, this kind of ta-da moment. And Jason Hedges, who's a press association photographer who was covering this particular visit, he did a brilliant job of capturing some of the moments. Well, the guy on the right doesn't look uh, too bothered, does he? But I can assure you he was excited. <laughs> Um, and we get this, then this wonderful engagement, you know, all the crew are waiting to come and see the plate. And you can imagine the tension and the relief from that tension once I know I've done my bit and I've got it right, especially if I've got it right first time, which I try and do these, these days, because as you can understand, you know, it's quite a process to complete. But I'm aiming to make things, you see, I'm aiming to make photographs again, just like I did when I was a young boy. And um, when I was 12 years old, I converted my bedroom, my bedroom into a dark room. I used to love that 
classic feeling of seeing an image appear in the chemicals. That's what I'm aiming to do on the road, to make things that you don't need software to see. The people can see the finished result right there and then and look at them. They're all absolutely captivated, got their phones out. They can't believe what they've seen. And so there's the finished glass plate um, that I'm holding just after those moments there. Um, and you can see that's a <laughs> relaxed face, not a tense face, um, as I'm holding that plate up there for the photographer to, to uh, take a photograph of that moment. And looking back at the, the mission map there on my, on my door, you know, the orange dots are the ones, the stations that I visited. And it gives me like a little heart in mouth moment even now to look back at that because I've obviously done a lot more stations since June 2018, which is when the photograph was taken. And to see that there, it's like, oh no, let's not rewind to there because you know, I've still got a lot more to do. So when you look at the mission map now, of course, there are a lot more orange dots uh, that are completed and a lot more stories to tell. And there you are when it's flipped around the right way, because when you first view the plate, it's laterally inverted. Um, we can cover a bit of that later as well, if you like, but I'm going to keep things moving for the moment. But this is the glass plate viewed the right way around. And I'd like to show you this now, look. I'm going to zoom in. This is a crop from the glass plate, just to remind you, if you didn't know already, that even after 169 years, wet collodion is still the highest resolution photographic process ever invented. And that's a crop from the plate, not on a particularly high resolution scan. You know, the, the, the scan is... Um, about 140 megabytes in total. So you can imagine if you scanned it in even higher resolution, you'd see even more. But just to remind you, there's the area look that it's taken from. If you just look at that little group of people there um, in that large plate. And this is, although it's not the same photograph as we've just been looking at, this is the moment that people are seeing when they, when they see the image appear. So bear in mind, I've exposed the plate. I've um, poured developer over it in Nina under a red light to uh, reveal the latent image. And once I've stopped it and washed it with water, um, the plate then isn't very sensitive to light at all. So I can do this magical moment where I can open the door of Nina and the, put the plate in a tray right in the doorway of Nina and pour fixer over it. And this is what happens. So a handmade plate, you know, 10 minutes ago, this plate wouldn't have existed. This photograph wouldn't have existed. There, there wouldn't have been chemicals on that piece of glass. And it's still an utter thrill for me even now. And you can imagine the thrill for the people who've seen it the first time. And that kind of brings me on to a notion, just to touch on again for the moment, that you know, these plates, although they are beautiful in themselves, they've actually provided a, an amazing experience for everyone involved. We've had a nice time. We've talked we've laughed while we've organized everyone into place and then they've seen this piece of alchemy happen as they see it you know and it's something they'll remember for the rest of their days and the, and the plates become uh, a memento of that now we've already touched on logistics and what it is to carry glass and chemicals and whatnot and so can you you might be getting to understand that the distance between nina my mobile darkroom and the camera becomes critical and at various remote locations around the coast, because obviously that's where lifeboat stations often are, um, that can be quite a challenge. And the number of times people have seen this photograph and they say, oh, well, thank goodness, you know, it wasn't that good for you. You, you uh, were able to park so close to the lifeboat station. Like, no, this is the winch house to operate the lift that takes you 140 feet down the cliff face to the lifeboat station. And so, this is the scene I'm actually presented with. There's the lifeboat station down there. So you can imagine if I need to make photographs in the lifeboat station, um, I've got to either take the steps or take the lift, whichever's quicker. Um, I got very fit that day. And then, you know, what happens if you uh, need to go to the Isles of Scilly, where there's one lifeboat station and you work with wet collodion and you work with a mobile darkroom? Well, you need to take your darkroom with you and find a way of doing it. Now, right there, that was a heart and mouth moment, <laughs> I can tell you. Um, and you know, people have said to me, 
Oh, come on, Jack, that's a bit ridiculous. Why didn't you just take a darkroom tent? Like, well, where's the story in that? If there's a company that will take your darkroom for you, that will offer you to do it for you, and they'll hoist it onto the only freighter that goes between the Isles of Scilly and the mainland. If you know me now, you'll know that's the option I'll take. I won't be taking the tent. I'll be taking my ambulance on a freighter. Um, because my true reward is for instances like this where I can tell you this story and show you this little clip of video. But I must say my heart was in my mouth when I saw her up there. And it opens up this door to engagement. You know, the people often ask me, why are you going to all of this trouble? Well, it's special. And as I said before, people remember it, you know. And it means that you can just hold, you can, you can just hand somebody a glass plate when it's finished and they can, you know, to see them holding their own portrait that didn't exist 15 minutes beforehand is something very, very special. And as I say, in 50 years time, you won't need software to look at it. You won't need to make sure you've done all your upgrades to be able to look at this image. If you've got eyes, you can see it. And I love that. And this chap's a very famous coxswain on the, uh, on the East Coast. Um, sorry, just go back to the other one, just to speak more about Leafy here. Leafy was the first woman that I photographed. Um, and this is all a very moving day. You know, she, she, we made this photograph and she got a bit teary because she was so blown away by the whole experience. Um, and she was so blown away with how she looked in it. And it turned out that just a day or two beforehand, her father had died and he, and she wished that he'd been able to see this, um, which is why she was watery eyed in the photograph. And you know, there are so many little special stories on the journey that come along like that. You know, I photographed two and a half thousand volunteers now, um, one way or another, you know, may, maybe they've been part of the crew portrait or as individuals like this. And there's so many special stories. Um, so, you know, behind a simple photograph like this are a myriad of extra stories to tell. And one day I'll do my best to maybe tell them all somehow. And going back to Tag here, he's the Alder Coxon. There's a very famous video actually from the 90s of him uh, um, launching the lifeboats, the their all weather lifeboat, which you can see just behind him um, off the beach in Alderborough. And they get um, broadsided by a wave and his skill in, and his quick thinking to actually not try and pump her out, power her out, bow first he quickly quickly just thinks what am I going to do here and he takes her out of stern and the waves are crashing over the stern of the deck of the, of the lifeboat um so look up that video on YouTube Alderborough launch Alderborough rough weather launch um after this talk and I'm sure you'll be entertained by that and just think of this guy um with his quick thinking and you know speaking about engagement it all means the special nature of this story and the special nature of the stories result in things like this. You know, who would have thought the RNLI would have been on the front cover of the Independent Weekend magazine? And as it turned out, one of the very last um, uh, front covers of this particular magazine, uh, it, it went out of print shortly afterwards. And I love the title for this. They call it Riders on the Storm. I thought it was a, a fantastic title with a beautiful, um, there are two double page spreads inside. And it was just a, a wonderful, wonderful moment to see these, to see a, a light shone on the greatness of these people in this way, you know, it's just fantastic. And when those logistics on the road are done, you know, it doesn't end because I then need to bring all those plates back to the studio. And every step with wet collodion is a stage to mess it up. You know, you've got to have your eye on the ball at every single stage. From the moment I've been in into my studio and then look, I've got a hot plate there on my table, which is the table just behind me here, um, because I'm varnishing the plates. The last chemical stage with the plates is to varnish them. And if the alcohol in the varnish is stronger than the alcohol in the collodion that you made on the day, then that varnish will just dissolve the image right off the plate. So you could have driven hundreds and hundreds of miles. I had all that time, all that wonderful, those wonderful moments with the lifeboat crew um, and it was all for nothing. So, um, you know, the biggest lesson is uh, make sure you scan the plate first. So that's a real skate over really. I'm, you know, I must confess over the process, over the logistics. Um, and so now I'm gonna show you some finished examples. I know we've seen a few already, but here are some more. 
Um, remember, the remit is to visit every RNLI lifeboat station. And when I first started back in 2015, so my first lifeboat station was, um, uh, was Southwold on the 12th of January 2015 uh, on the Suffolk coast. Um, I just had a simple remit, which is to make three photographs at each station. One was of the coxswain. This is, a, this is the most recent coxswain portrait I made, the last one I made before lockdown, and Dave Milford from Plymouth. Um, in March 2020. There are coxswains at all-weather lifeboat stations. All-weather lifeboat stations are the big orange boats, the famous ones with the orange wheelhouse and the blue hull. Um, but there are also inshore lifeboat stations, um, which are much smaller lifeboats. You know, they're, they're also very, very capable vessels, um, but they're ribs, you know, rigid inflatables um, or smaller inflatables. Um, and the most qualified people at those stations are the helmsmen, or the, you know, the helms, they're also female helms as well. But these are the helms from Minehead. And this is you know, this piece of kit. What a piece of kit. It's about 30 years old, I believe, um, and a totally submersible launch tractor. So that thing can go underwater um, or get swamped by water. Or if the engine fails and the tide comes in and it's swamped by water, it just doesn't matter. They just close the lid on the top and the tide goes out and they recover it on the low tide. Um, uh, just a phenomenal piece of kit, you know, it's like something out of an animation, it's incredible. Um, but I just loved placing these, uh, these five fantastic men on that piece of kit to make this photograph. And of course I need to photograph the crew. Uh, this is the crew at Margate in June 2017. And you know, again, an, an amazing example of the cooperation that I'm able to get from these guys. Um, they put that boat exactly where I wanted it, you know, with the, I, I like, to, if I can, to include the community behind or the settings of where the lifeboat is based, um, is stationed. Um, and, and as you can see from the tire tracks, there's a bit of maneuvering and they popped it right there for me. And I also photographed the boathouse view and this was the original concept behind the lifeboat station project. When I first conceived it back in 2012. I was just going to photograph the boathouse views, which seems crazy now, but that was the original remit, but that's an idea that's become incorporated into the project now. And this is the very first plate that I made. And Wet Collodion has an amazing habit of um, capturing the, not only the weather and the feel of the day, but also your mood and what was going on. And see those jittery marks there in the top right? That was me nervously pouring the developer across the plate on that very first plate on the very first day. And I got, didn't get it quite right and it comes across in the plate, but I love it for that, because that tells a story in itself. You know, that's evidence of those nerves on the very first day of the project in January 2015. And the, the idea behind the boathouse views is to have them all geographically correctly placed around a gallery. It had to be a big gallery, because there'd be 238 boathouse views, um, all in geographical order. So the sensation is when you're standing in the middle of the gallery, or you know, wherever the venue happens to be, and you look around, it's like what, looking around the entire coast. Now these aren't necessarily immediately flank stations, but they are on the same piece of coastline to give you an idea of what that might look like. You know, so you've got on the left there, lower stopped, that's the most easterly point on the, uh, on the coast. Um, Southwold you've just seen, Aldborough, where I mentioned about the lifeboat being launched off the Shingle Beach and the Harridge on the right. And you've four very different locations, but all with the same job in hand, you know, and I love that these photographs strip everything down to the bare basics. No matter what the vessel, no matter how many crew attend, this is the job. When the emergency pages go off, they have to launch the vessel out to sea, whatever the mechanism, whatever the vessel, and whatever the quantity of people doing it. So I love the simplicity of these photographs for that. And as I mentioned earlier on with Leafy, um, who was holding her plate, um, I soon realized that there were opportunities and almost my duty, really, to, to photograph other aspects of the RNLI too. And what better opportunity than to champion the women who are um, volunteering just alongside the men doing exactly the same job. Um, and I, I love it when people write to me to say that they've joined the RNLI because they've seen images like these women of Hastings and realized that they could join too. And I love this photograph too, because this is the first station that I've been to where not only is there a female coxswain, um, a woman called Sloan, she's in the middle of these seven here, um, but also where, um, half of the volunteers on the crew are women. And I love that, this station for that, and therefore this photograph for that. And how can I not make a photograph of a scene like this? You know, 
a really gentle scene that really captures the camaraderie and the peacefulness of a station. Um, you know, they, they really are a hub of the community where people just like to, where the local volunteers like to hang out and meet up um, either ahead of training or for a cup of tea, something like that, you know. And again, you know, I, I, what, something that's happened quite a lot on, on the road is that I'm, I'm commissioned to make portraits and sometimes the private commissions, which help to fund the project as well, they become, you know, if they end up being like this, I really, really want to include it in the project. So I often just ask people, say, look, this, we've ended up with a fantastic portrait here. Could we possibly include that in the project too? And everyone without fail says yes, you know, because they want, they just want to be a part of it, which is wonderful for me and wonderful for the people involved. And I just love this one of Tony in Dover. What a, what a man. Now, people think of me, often think of me as a photographer. I don't see myself as a photographer. Well, obviously I can do photography, well, I hope I can. Um, I see myself as a picture maker, as a storyteller. And that's become clear throughout the project. And I just want to show you a little two minute film now um, because I also make audio recordings. And I want to show you this to show you why I make audio recordings. So it's some iPhone footage combined with an audio recording that I made. Okay, here we go then. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, mate. Thanks for that. I'll take it uh, just when we're 100 metres off or so, Penny. Yeah, I'll be safe. In the old days, that coxswain was almost always at the helm. You know, he might be at the helm 20 hours or... And it was, you know, I've had stories of coxswains being carried out of boats. So you don't really want to have a situation like that in the modern age. You should be a leader, not a commander. And everyone on board's a volunteer, so you're leading a group of people, you're not commanding a lot of people. And that role hasn't changed. You know, the person who listens to their conscience is the person that makes the good coxswain. And if somebody says, do you think that's right, you should always question yourself. You know, you have no right to, to be right every time. If somebody says, let's just think about that, you go, yeah, I'll think about that. Yeah, it's all yours. I have control. No, obviously. So we're presently heading into Tobermory, where we're going to tie up. It's quite a pleasant afternoon in Tobermory, if you exclude the rain, the cloud and the wind. Just going through, Shackle with Stuart. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, can you see, I, I make those audio recordings because they teach you so much more about about lifeboating and about people than photography can do alone in some cases. So in that film, I love that we've learned about the fact that, um, you know, coxswains would be at the helm for so many hours and would have to be carried out um, because they're just basically welded in position at the helm. Um, we've learned what it is to see inside the mind of a coxswain. You, know, you need to be a leader, not a commander. You know, all these little nuances and you have no right to be right every time. You know, what a life lesson for us all. And then there's another aspect too, the dialects. And dialects are softening. And I love to be able to re record dialects for posterity. And even though that film was made in Tobermory, uh, Angus isn't actually from Tobermory, he's from Orkney. So that's an Orcadian uh, accent we're hearing there. And again, all part of, part of the document I'm making. So where am I at now? Uh, as of March the 15th, so just before lockdown, uh, that was my 150th lifeboat station um, and there are now over 600 handmade photographs on the website which means that there'll be about a thousand when I'm finished because there are just 88 lifeboat stations to go um, which I think is still about another two and a half years work and it's been just over five years so far I think as Craig mentioned at the start it'll be about eight years in total and I thought it'd be three to five years when I first started um, which seems utterly laughable now.
Um, and we'll just mentioned lockdown there. If you want to do a little bit more looking um, after this talk, um, if you, or if you just type in lifeboatstationproject.com uh, into your browser and then forward slash hold dash fast, uh, you'll find this blog post. Um, this is where I was on the 17th of March. I was about to photograph this lifeboat station and ITV were about to turn up to uh, do a piece for national television. Um, and that was it, the line was drawn. Um, and if you want to see how that period between lockdown and right now has been bookended, if you like, um, I'm, I'm now embarking or just pulling together a new big idea. Um, and you can read the blog post about that too, called My New Big Idea. It's all on the website. When you go to the homepage to see the recent blog posts, go to the homepage and just scroll down a little bit further and you'll see all the recent blog posts sitting there. Um, and you'll find these videos and things nestled within those and the story, the recent story, as well as the story from over the last few years. And so another intriguing aspect to the project that you know, I found fascinating and exhausting at times, um, trying to work out the puzzle, because not only is it the puzzle of the, of the project itself, but there's the puzzle of how to fund it. Because I mentioned right at the start that um, I haven't been commissioned by anybody to make this body of work. Um, so I have to be imaginative at all times of how to do that. So um, I'm proud. I, I, I don't mind saying I'm proud either, because I think it's no mean feat for a photographer or any, any artist in the modern era to say that um, the project's costs, you know, the cost of making the work is, is mostly funded by print sales. Um, so people say to me when I get back from the road, oh, you know, you have a nice rest now, Jack. <laughs> no, I'm gonna be scanning all those glass plates I've made and honoring all the print orders that are waiting in the wings um, because that's the funding of the project and I need to um, make money to pay for what I've just done and to make sure I can pay my domestic bills as well. Um, so this is what the print table can often look back look like within the week or so of getting back, you know, with glass plates scanned and prints being ordered, um, as I say, to, to form the bedrock of the Lifeboat Station project's funding. And I also do it in other, in other ways too. Um, there are many, many layers about the things I offer through my online shop, but this is a, a lovely item that I first introduced um, in December 2016 um, that carries the the words of the founder of the RNLI, Sir William Hillary, with courage, nothing is impossible. And when I sold the first one, um, or the first batch of them, one of the lifeboat crew got in touch with me to say, oh, I've clipped it to my pager, Jack. What do you think of that? I said, Simon, that's amazing. Would you mind if I, um, if I shared that online? He said, no, 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 of course, go for it. And of course, what happens then? This happens. And this happens. Um, so, you know, I have no, now over, well over 100 photographs from lifeboat crew who've clipped my lifeboat station project keyring to their pager as a reminder of those motivational words from their founder. Um, and then, if, so if those things fund the project and the cost of the project, where does the living come from? You know, all of these things have been a real puzzle, you know, have actually had me in terrifying financial moments over the years. But that's all got better because of one thing, and that's Patreon. Um, if you're not familiar with it, it's a crowdfunding platform um, that enables, rather than like Kickstarter, where it's like an all or nothing scenario where you're trying to get a lump of money for one particular project or idea, say publishing a book, as many people on here are doing. And this enables people who love the project and are fans of the project and are rooting for me to commit to it as well and become a patron. And the number of patrons who've um, written to me after and said, oh, I didn't know it was so cheap. I thought I was going to have to spend like fifty pounds a month. You know, one pound twenty a month um, is the entry level uh, that patrons can come on board. And there's a whole wealth of extra posts, uh, podcasts, and videos um, that I make for my patrons as well. And that provides me with the living side of it, um, and to keep things going through the pandemic and beyond, and to keep the project. You know, so I'm ready to go straight back at it when I'm allowed to go back on the road to the lifeboat stations, and. Um, this is what's enabling me to do that, Patreon. And that's about that. And if uh, you'd like to follow the project, uh, you can follow on Twitter and via the website, lifeboatstationproject.com. Um, and I really recommend signing up for the newsletter too, because my main methods are Twitter, the newsletter, Patreon, and the website. They're the ways to be uh, engaged and involved with the project. And of course, if, I, if you know I'm on the road, uh, at a particular lifeboat station that's near you, um, come and see me. That's another way to engage is in real life.
And so that is that. Brilliant. Uh, Jack, Jack, that was wonderful. Thank you very much. I've, I've learned so much. What I've really learned is you're completely bonkers, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, well, maybe I'm normal and you're all bonkers. No, no, no. <laughs> this is an extraordinary undertaking. And um, thank you so much for sharing it with us on the, on the 6x6 social. Thank you, Craig.